from the Gothic Quarter in Barcelona. This is Market Movers, the podcast that gives you a closer look at the financial markets to trade responsibly. Here are your hosts, Lior Cohen and Yohai Elam. Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us and clicking the subscribe button. This is episode number 117, recorded on Friday, September 2nd. I'm your coach, Lior Cohen, and joining me, he didn't go on vacation just so he can stay here and talk about the NFP report, Yochai Elam. How's it going, Yochai? I'm doing great. All, all fired up. Yeah. All fired up. And even though we are talking on Friday, the jobs report, uh, the all in the elusive jobs report, we're, we're recording it before the results. So again, no spoilers, you find? No spoilers, but we do have some interesting information for you, don't yeah, we? Yeah, exactly. So this week we'll have a little bit more of a perspective and, uh, and analyze the NFP report, a preview for ECB's uh, meeting and an overview for the main events of the week. But before we start with the ECB and what's going on forward, let's take a look a little bit backwards about the NFP. I mean, that's like the crown jewel of economic data, right? That's the one that really moves market yeah, a lot. first Friday of the month, famous, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I thought maybe it's a good idea to try to get a little bit of more of a grasp of how it uh, has an impact on the financial markets. So we used to talk a lot about it uh, in the perspective of the uh, how it moves the US dollar and the bonds and the expectations for interest rates and even the precious metals. Let's try to get a little bit more of a Bayesian analysis, which uh, tries to delve into how how it moves uh, the markets instead of just the, the main basic frequentist analysis of just saying, oh yeah, there's a correlation. So this will lead to that and uh, that's it. Let's try to get a little bit more of a grasp. I try to focus on the S&P 500 and the dollar yen. Let's start yeah. with the dollar yen. That's more to your heart, I believe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So if we do just a correlation, as one would expect, uh, whenever there is a surprise between the surprise, I mean that the headline figure, that's what we're going to look at. The headline figure of the job number of jobs added into the labor market have uh, gone higher than expected. Compare that to the percent changes on the dollar yen on that day of the release. Over the last couple of years, it was a strong and a positive correlation of a 0.48. Even if I take a little bit more of a bigger sample over the last four, four years, even that's the data that I've collected, uh, it's still pretty solid. But So strong NFP, strong dollar, weak NFP, weak dollar. Yeah, especially for the dollar yen, as we said, because uh, it's much more, you know, as you said uh, many times, right? It's much more focused on the, what's going on with, you, with the US economy, right. as opposed to the Euro or, or the Looney or the Aussie that, you know, they're a little bit more, you know, free spirit yeah. kind of things. Yeah, yeah. they have other moving parts over there. Yeah, they're a little bit more loose. So from the frequentist point of view, yeah, it's a strong correlation, but let's try to get a little bit more of a grasp of how it actually does react. So if I look at the last couple of years on the surprise on, as I said, again, there's a positive surprise. I mean, the headline figure came higher than expected, as was the case in the last couple of reports. Over the last couple of years, what do you think the odds are for the dollar yen to actually also uh, strengthen? I mean, the the dollar against the yen to strengthen. Odds are high, I would say. Yeah, so it's around 63%. Mm, I would guess even higher. So 63% is uh, it's, it's okay. It's not bad, but not great. Yeah. So it means that if there is, uh, based on these uh, data, uh, it suggests that if the NFP uh, headline figure at face value comes higher than expected, there is a 63% chance that the dollar will strengthen against the yen. But the other way around, if it comes below expectations, uh, so the NFP, the headline figure is lower than what the headline, than what the market estimated, what do you think the odds are of the dollar to weaken against the yen. So the dollar yen actually comes down. Well, I would guess uh, more of the same, right? You think it's symmetrical, something. yeah. So it seems like it's not actually, and it's oh, like no. actually in eight out of the nine times over the last couple of years, so 89% of the times it's actually correlated as one would expect. So it means there is like an 89% chance that whenever the headline figure comes below expectations, that uh, the dollar yen will, uh, will decline. Okay, so if this correlation continues and we have a better than expected NFP, 
we cannot be really sure dollar yen is going to strengthen. But if we have missing expectations, uh, selling dollar yen has a better chances. Of, yeah, exactly. Of it's much more likely trade. to go on that way. So okay. maybe it's uh, in a way it's probably related in a way to what the Fed will do, obviously, right? There's yeah. There's that going on in the background. So this brings me to how the market react to uh, the S&P. Let's look at the stock market, how the stock market reacts to the all inclusive NFP report. So for that, if we look at over the last couple of years, the chances of the S&P to rise, given that there is a surprise, a positive surprise, the odds are were 45%, hmm. while for a decline, i.e. that given that the NFP was below expectations, the odds that uh, the S&P also declined were 55%. So probably around the 50% mark. So it's not, it's no like- No clear correlation. Yeah, so it looks like a coin flip. Even if we look at it from a frequentist point of view and just look at the correlation, it's also pretty 0 0.07. So it's not a significant correlation. It, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Basically. Yeah, but <laughs> instead of taking it from the frequentist, let's try to break it down to 2015, 2016. And that's where maybe comes into play what the Fed will do. And you'll give us a, your perspective perspective on it. So in 2015, actually, if there was a positive surprise, the chances of the S&P to rise was only 16%. Hmm. So in one, only in one out of the six times in the last year that the, the NFP, the headline figure came higher than expected, the only one out of those six times, the S&P uh, rose. Yeah. So it's well, that, that can be explained by, well, last year, if you remember, December 2015, we finally had the rate hike, the first rate hike in nearly a decade, which was well telegraphed for over a year since the Fed ended tapering, uh, ended its QE in October 2014. And during last Last year, during 2015, uh, we had mixed expectations. When is the Fed going to raise rates? There was always this suspense. So a positive non farm payrolls report meant that the rate hike is getting closer, which is bad for stocks. And that means that good news was bad news. And of course, the other way around, bad news for the economy meant good news for stocks because that meant the Fed would push back on rate hike expectations until we finally had that rate hike just before Christmas. Yeah, so maybe that's kind of more of what went about in 2015 yeah. when it come to the stock market and how it reacted to the NFP report. So it was like uh, the canary in the gold mine or in the coal mine, something coal mine. mine. Yeah, yeah coal or gold, something. Yeah, some some sort of a mine. Uh, yeah, it was coal. And um, that was like, uh, yeah, oh, there's a good NFPs and yeah, the Fed will raise rates. So the market reacted uh, uh, negatively to that. But it's not the case for 2016. For 2016, actually, uh, so far this year, the chances of the S&P to rise, given that, uh, that there was a positive surprise, the chances were actually 80%. So if anything, now it's the reverse. It seems like in four out of the five times this year so far, whenever there was a positive surprise, the S&P also rose. So it's more in line with not what the Fed will do, but with basically the economy is doing well. You know, like the basic economics. Yeah, the sense, economy yeah. is doing well, the S&P should rise. The economy is not doing so well, the S&P yeah, should fall. Straightforward. If the economy is doing well, that's good for stocks because companies can make more money because yeah, the yeah. economy is doing So better. that's what it seems to be the case. And where the Fed is coming about on this issue, it seems like just the markets are have crossed out the Fed basically to any skeptical. Yeah, we've seen that also, uh, well, throughout the year that the Fed, the markets believe that the dovish Fed more and more, skeptical that the Fed will ever move to its second rate hike, uh, see the Fed worried about China at the beginning of the year, about Brexit later on, about you name it, looking for excuses not to raise rates. Even we look at the near past at Jackson Hole, when Yellen said the case is strengthening, markets were a bit, were, weren't sure. When she said the case for rate hike is strengthening, the dollar advanced a bit and then went back down. They, only when Fisher said something much, much more explicit that it's consistent with the rate hike in uh, September, finally saying some clear, straightforward words, a rare opportunity that will probably not return anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Then only then we saw the, the reaction, the, the markets beginning to believe. But as we speak today, just before the NFP, bond markets are still skeptical. So that yeah, yeah, the odds are currently for a September rate hike at 24%. Yeah. So it's okay. not like uh, too 
they are not too impressed with what yeah. the hawkish stance. So in general, the market see a positive NFP as a win-win situation. That means the economy is doing well, wages are rising, more people have jobs. Even the work week advanced uh, last month, and the Fed will still not raise rates. Uh, you can put it also on the election. Uh, elections coming up in November. Whatever you want, put it on. Markets just don't think the Fed will raise mm. rates. So yeah, they've crossed. Let the me just throw you a curveball. Something <laughs> I haven't told you before the before we did the research, just so I can surprise you. All right. I'm such a great guy, as you can see. If you look at the implied probabilities as derived from the bonds market that the CME uh, covers, I've also looked at it mm. and how did they react? Uh, I looked at the December rate time because I wanted to look over the course of a year. So I mm. didn't, I just look at the, the, the odds of a rate hike in September, in uh, sorry, in December of uh, 2016. Over the last uh, year, how the how the chances moved over uh, whenever there was the NFP report that came out, and actually we do see, as one would expect, a positive and strong correlation, 0.77. But you say, okay, it's very few numbers. Even if you look at the Bayesian analysis, it's not bad. Whenever there was a, a positive surprise, the chances of a of the odds going up were 60%. Not great, but not bad. Uh, but the other way around, whenever the there was a negative surprise, i.e. the NFP came below expectations, the chances of a rate hike declined 100% of the time. Yeah. So as like, so it's still not bad, It's but it's like mo mostly the markets are more into, oh yeah, just finding yeah, excuses yeah. No, yes, to bring right. down. We, what we said, I mean, it goes hand in hand with the, we talked about the stock markets. Each time, each time the Fed has an excuse not to raise rates, bond markets are sure 100% certain about it. Yeah. When there is a reason to raise rates. They're uh, a little bit more skeptical. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're leaning towards, but the, the way less, uh, but they're still uh, skeptical about it so it doesn't hold out uh, as strongly as one would expect and uh, yeah that's uh, one of the problems I mean Bernanke always said like uh, what that monetary policy is 98% communication right and 2% actually implementing it yeah so on this issue I think the Fed is has been pretty much not doing its job and it's uh, and it has been confusing the markets, trying to take a hawkish stance while the markets are trying to cross them off. And there is, a, it seems like, because yeah, we, we talked about a lot, we're not gonna delve into it again, but it just seemed like there is a little bit of a problem between the communications uh, between the Fed and the markets. And, uh, and, and I think this also goes about in showing that at least in the stock market, the, the markets are pretty much ruling crossing them off and it's not like it's going to have an impact as was the case in 2015. All right, let's move on to the ECB. Yeah, the Draghi show is back. Uh, the last two shows were quite disappointing, I must say. This time should be different, hopefully be different, ought to be different because of a few reasons. First of all, uh, last meeting was in July in the summer. Now we're back to school. The meeting is in September. Secondly, we have as if we have every three months, we have fresh forecasts. And uh, another re third reason is that the recent inflation figures missed expectations. That means just a bit, but they, they show that the advance in inflation is not going anywhere fast. Headline inflation remained 0.2, didn't rise to 0.3. Core inflation slipped back from 0 0.9 to 0 0.8. The ECB is shooting all its ammunition, I think. Uh, so he has been criticized, right, recently over this whole negative interest rates, probably from the from the banks, and yeah. he's getting on a lot of uh, a lot of pressure, right? It's because it's pretty much uncharted territory. The whole yeah, it's not. Uncharted. Just, just let's look at what he said back in July. He said that. Uh, oh, I mean, a small comment that uh, caught my attention. He said that the ECB cares about the shares of banks. Why? Because a stronger bank, a bank that has a higher market uh, cap, uh, has a higher tendency to uh, lend money to the economy and, and lift inflation. Transmission mechanism. So they do care about shares, but if they care about shares, negative rates are what kills shares, or enough kills, but you know, uh, pulls them down because when interest rates are very low or even negative, it's hard for banks to find the gap between deposits and lending out money. That means the profit. So yeah, there is also in Japan, they began with negative rates and they're not really sure about it. The ECB basically says we're doing everything we can to lift inflation and uh, they're upping their 
rhetoric on governments to do more. Each time it's a bit more. At some point, maybe Draghi will just say, listen, I don't have anything more to do. Just leave the press conference in anger. Yeah, <laughs> just let the fiscals do their job. And that's yeah, what I did all over the yeah. place. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, like throwing oil at, uh, at the motor. Eventually the motor will have to start moving, but you cannot just dump more oil to lubricate it. It's not going to work. I mean, yeah. uh, at, at a certain point, this whole monetary policy of flushing with uh, so much funds into the market, it's like eventually it's not going to do so how much more good it could do. I mean, eventually people will just have to start spending and that's what we're not seeing so much. Yeah, and the and, biggest success. And, and firms to invest. Yeah, yeah. So well, interest rates are lower, uh, at least here in Spain where mortgages are attached to the Euribor, people have a bit more spare cash, but it's not the case in all the countries. The exchange rate, that's the biggest success. Lower exchange rate, it does help growth a bit. And via exports and inflation is off off the bottom, but it's certainly not enough. I think we talked about this in the past. We need drug is going to say that. Well, drug is going to call governments to do more basically structural reform, which is sort of non-controversial. He's not going to say fiscal stimulus, which I think is much more needed. Um, not going to bring in the chopper. No chopper. Even even though EIB bonds, the European Investment Bank, is an institution like the ECB that can lend money to investments, and the ECB can use its QE if it needs to do more QE, just to buy EIB bonds, something that already exists, and to help uh, perhaps investment. But that would the ECB cannot do it on its own. It needs the political backing, governments to tell the EIB to really lend out the money or. I mean, that would be a substitute to outright fiscal stimulus. But um, so on one hand, the ECB probably wants to do more because it's not achieving its targets. Uh, on the other hand, it has limited scope. The only thing that I think they could do this time is announce that the QE program is going to be extended beyond March 2017, uh, beyond the next six months. That's when it's officially, well, when it officially ends. And yeah, it's not that long. It's only six months. Yeah. A uh, reminder, when they introduced the program in uh, January 2015, they announced that it'll end now, in September 2016, and uh, later along the line, they uh, extended it. And now maybe it's a good chance to extend it. Again, there's the question of, but what will they buy? Will the ECB eventually run out of uh, bonds? Yeah, buy? do they still have more to buy? I mean, do, I mean, I mean, that's the, that's the question, right? I mean, that's what happened in the, in Britain, right? They had like a little bit of a problem in implementing their asset purchase yeah, program. I think in Britain, eventually we've seen it was a one-time uh, blip. Uh, but yeah, the effectiveness of QE, as we know, also in the US is limited. I mean, first move is, is significant and it has diminishing returns, as Bernanke said. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and uh, so basically you think that maybe he will only announce an extension of the QE, will he also consider expanding it or you think it's less likely? I don't think it's likely. It's already, it's running at 80 billion a month. Uh, and well, this might wait for December. You never know, but that's the easy step to do. It's just some kind of forward guidance, basically. So uh, he'll call governments to do more. I'll be surprised if they introduce more measures. He's going to look tired. <laughs> they, don't, they don't let him sleep a lot, huh? Yeah. They, what, what do you think the ECB can do or... I Should think, yeah, they, they're just limited in what they can do at this point. It's like, uh, okay, monetary policy, it can get you so far. Eventually, you'll need some more fiscal stimulus or for the private sector to return and start investing and for people to spend more money. But so far, it seems like uh, it's a very slow way uh, at a very slow pace it go goes about. And, yeah. um, and the whole issue of investment it also has been puzzling a lot of people, not only in Europe, but also in the US. What's going on? Why, if rates are so low, why? companies aren't investing. Some uh, attribute it to maybe there is uh, the low productivity, some attribute it maybe to a uh, slower demand and maybe uh, lower growth looking forward. The earnings are not going, are not going anywhere. All the oil uh, and commodities basically are also not doing well. So that also brings about yeah. reducing CapEx. So there's a lot of, and maybe banks are a little bit still uh, in Europe, more certainly. reserved, yeah, and, uh, and more conservative than what than what they were uh, ten years ago. So I think all these factors, and maybe there are some more. 
but it return it, re <laughs> it needs some more research in order to get a grasp of what's going on in order for the ecb actually maybe to fix it if they even can i mean at this point it seems like uh, they reach their limits basically yeah remember they uh, at the beginning they bought uh, asset backed securities abs no the idea was to push some money into the real economy but the second target was also to increase the, this this market of abs that means that okay there's more activity in the market the ecb is, an, is a big player there and now there will be more abs running in the market same thing i think with corporate bonds uh, the implementation began in june so if the ecb buys corporate bonds maybe this will encourage more corporates to issue fresh bonds that means lending money and investing it i don't know well it's too early to say and that's why i think the ecb will not do anything just yet maybe in december maybe in march but uh, as far as i know the market I mean, ECB manages to buy bonds. <laughs> that is a success. But increasing the, the market doesn't work just mm. yet. All right. Okay, moving forward for the upcoming week, Yochai. Well, and... apart from the main dish, which is the ECB's meeting on Thursday, let's begin from the top. On Monday, we'll have um, reactions to the non from perils, of course, which we will know in a few hours. On Monday, it's also back bank holiday in uh, the United States. It's Labor Day. Yeah, Labor Day. So, yeah, it's going to be very slow in Europe, probably, also, no? Europe and Asia will probably have a very slow volumes, also, no? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it has a big effect. It's the biggest market. Also on Monday, we have the services PMI from the United Kingdom. So far, we've seen a big bounce in business confidence in the construction and manufacturing sectors. Let's see if it is also seen in the biggest sector services. On Tuesday, we have rate decision in Australia. No changes expected. Uh, we have a change of guard. Philip Lowe is the new governor instead of Glenn Stevens. And uh, let's see if there is anything new. Probably not going to rock the boat, at least not now. Another interesting figure is big event in the US. On Tuesday, we have the ISM non-manufacturing PMI, uh, service sector report, usually a hint for the NFP, not this time, but it should still have some market impact. Yeah, this came after the manufacturing PMI was yeah, manufacturing was pretty disaster. terrible. Yeah, it fell uh, 2.6 points to contraction territory under 50 points. And yeah, it is worrying, of course. Services is still um, well, last time it was 55.5 and let's see if it remains upbeat or is dragged down like manufacturing. Uh, well, for those trading the Kiwi, we have the bi-weekly GDT price index, the milk auction, if you wish. A speech by, well, Thomas Jordan of the Jordan of the S&B shouldn't be a big deal. GDP in Australia, quite important, released only once, once per quarter, yeah. first and final. So <laughs> uh, Australia hasn't seen a recession since the early 90s. I'll probably they'll probably continue the upswing on Wednesday more hard data from the UK manufacturing production for July post Brexit so a bit more of hard data not the most important data retail sales are more important uh, it's more services economy like the US uh, we have rate decision in Canada also on Wednesday no changes expected there let's see uh, how they uh, react to recent GDP figures which were mixed on one hand the economy grew nicely in June there they release it on a monthly basis but as a whole, the economy is uh, moving quite slowly in Canada. Blame oil. The JOLTS job openings in the US, they could provide more insight, even though it's a bit belated. It's a figure for July. But if the NFP is a bit mixed, maybe it'll have some impact. It used to have a bigger impact in the past. We have trade downs from China. That should be interesting in terms of exports and imports. Remember, the top line figures are more important than the bottom line ones. Of course, on Thursday, the ECB and the belated crude oil inventories due to the Labor uh, Day holiday. And on Friday, should be a bit more quiet uh, with, uh, well, again, big week for Canada. A Canadian jobs report on Friday this week, this time one week after the NFP. So the big action, there is a culmination of events leading to the ECB and then some kind of hangover, I guess, on Friday. Mm, the hangover, yeah. part four. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's it. That's our show. Thank you as usual, Yochai. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. If you like our show, give us a five-star ratings on iTunes and you can subscribe to the show via Stitcher, email, RSS, or iTunes, whatever suits you fast. So until next week, this is Lior Sana for Yochai, saying have a great week and invest responsibly. This podcast should be used for educational, research, and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. There are no guarantees expressed or implied of future positive returns in regard to the subject matter contained herein. Understand the risks inherent in investing before making the decision to invest or consult an investment professional for more information. A reasonable due diligence has been performed in regards to the information in this podcast. However, the hosts and guests of this podcast expressly disclaim any liability for accidental emissions of information or errors in fact.
For comments, suggestions, and questions, visit the podcast page at forexcrunch.com or tradingnrg.com, where you can also find past episodes and subscribe to the show. Our listeners make market movers possible.